So how did the this rational expectation approach? How did it co it collapse totally theoretically? In policy, as I the, but in policy terms, it's not you cannot have rational expectation policy. It doesn't make any sense because rational expectation theory tells you that essentially you just have to money is super neutral. You just control. Markets are perfect, so there is not much you have to do. You just have to <coughs> perhaps try to eliminate all obstacles to competition. Try to, I don't know, I, I, if you are a, a rational expectation economist, you never believe that there is unemployment. And in fact, Lucas or Barra, one of the two, I had the quotation, even said, you know, I will say by the fact that people decide to have more leisure relatively to work. Because for them, unemployment is leisure. You understand? There is no unemployment. If people voluntarily decide not to supply labor, not to supply labor in the labor market. So essentially, uh, they, uh, they, there is no, doesn't make any sense to have a rational, rational expectation policy unless, okay, Unless you say, okay, there are all sorts of impediments around and we have to demolish to undo those impediments. But Russian expectation people, the, like Lucas, Sargent, and so forth, they believe that the economy is already, the American economy at least, is already in a, in a general equilibrium framework. So the, there are no real impediments. Do you follow me? And so they, there is no room for a Russian expectation policy. But the ideology of rational expectation, yes, generates policies in that respect. Generates an attitude toward uh, fiscal policies, toward budgetary policies, toward all sorts of other things. So that remained. That hasn't gone. But the theory collapsed totally. Collapse, to totally collapsed. It doesn't. And how did it collapse? Well, it collapsed because actually, generally, for people, okay. Like a guy called Frank Hunt in Cambridge. And Frank Hunt didn't get the Nobel Prize simply because he didn't get the Nobel Prize simply because he treats people so badly that so he, he treats you know, the Nobel Prize committee so badly that, that they would never give him they would have never given him the Nobel Prize. But he wrote a book which is called General Competitive Analysis. Uh, General Competitive Analysis in 1972 with Kenneth Arrow. Kenneth Arrow got the Nobel no Prize in, in, in precisely the general theory. So one was Frank Hahn. <coughs> Frank Hahn was professor at Cambridge and then became professor at the University of Siena. And he died only two years ago. He died two years ago. Uh, and he was the very first, okay? And he wrote in the journal of the London School of Economics, uh, an article which I have in all the readings that I, that, that I put on Google, on, on monetarism. Monetarism and economic theory. It's a very important 1980 article <coughs> in the uh, mm. uh, in Economica. And then he wrote an article in a bank uh, journal, <coughs> three bank reviews, which I could not retrieve, but uh, I could not retrieve electronically, but I had it because I photocopied it uh, in 1981 or 82, which is called Why. I am not a monetarist. It's a, and it's a, a fantastic, fantastic stuff. The whole thing came out in a book by, I mean, the whole idea was then condensed, developed into a book on uh, the 
which was published by Oxford. It's called Money and Inflation. Now, why Russia expectation uh, in Russia expectation theory about about equilibrium, the fact that the system is intended always toward equilibrium, and therefore money is super neutral. And what you have to control is what you have to avoid is to have inflation due to excessive money supply, essentially, is because the equilibrium of the Russian expectation people, as much as the equilibrium of Milton Friedman, is Pareto optimal. Okay? It's a unique single equilibrium based on Pareto optimality. You follow me? And therefore, you apply all the welfare theories there. In other words, no one can be better off without somebody else being worse off. That's the best thing you can get in the world, and that's it. Okay? That's the, the long and the Well, the important result, which I'm just stating here, by Frank Hunt, is that he shows, but this comes from general equilibrium results, huh? because the, the Russian expectation people are liars. They lie all the time. Yeah. He shows that you can have multiple inflationary equilibria, and this. This actually throws out of the window just about everything in Russian expectation. If you have many, many different equilibria, each of them is, can be inflationary. So your equilibrium can be an inflationary equilibrium. So your story doesn't hold, because if you have inflationary equilibria, the idea that the perfect Malaysian equilibrium is inflation. So, not only you can have inflationary equilibrium, you have inflationary equilibria, that is many of them. At this point, you cannot decide which is the best. Okay. Each of them has its own Pareto efficiency. You see? You, see? you cannot decide. You understand? Each of them. Therefore, that's it. You know, what are you telling me? You're telling me that your system, based on you know, agent rationality and everything, gets you to a unique single equilibrium which is non-inflationary. Well, this is not true. You can get multiple inflationary equilibrium. Each of them can be very efficient. There is no way you can decide which is superior to it. So, that's, so that kills a big chunk of Russian expectation. The Russian expectation people then, in, very much in reaction to the to the Frank Hahn story, they came up with an idea, okay, look, listen, but you know, what really we have is, you know, in, in our world, it's true, we have, you know, the world is made of uh, many agents, okay? These are agents. Uh, uh, <laughs> so, but okay, what we do, we lump all these people into one. So we have, okay? Okay? Okay, that's it. We lump into one. This is the representative agent. Do you follow? <laughs> so all this and and this representative agent is a fantastic agent because he also is a person which we don't know the gender of this person. Okay, we don't know whether it's a man, a woman. Or does it, we don't. Know. Uh, it's a representative agent. This agent behaves as a general equilibrium economy and does fantastic things such as uh, hires herself, himself, 
fires himself, herself. He's a, he's a fantastic <laughs> He does, does everything. He's, he's a complete idiot, by the way. He goes, you know, <laughs> also. But, and this, this representative agent, the collapse of the economy is a representative agent. So we are back to the single sector, the single, the one, the one, the one. You know, the story of economics that starts actually from the core model, which is specified differently theoretically, but it's the core model. We go to the representative firm, then we go to the representative industry, and then finally we come to, to, the, to, this, to this guy here, to this person, and they say, okay, this is the, uh, we, we believe that we can collapse the economy into a representative agent, this representative agent is a general equilibrium agent, so all the problems that Frank Hunt tells us here, they go away because the representative agent has can only have one equilibrium, you know. It's not necessarily true, huh? by the way. It's even that is not true. And it won't have inflation and so forth. It's representative. So they try to solve the issue with the representative agent model, OK? Mm -hmm. This right hand objections, they try to. And uh, then came two people, both of them from France. But one of them is a Briton who has been living in teaching at the University in Ex Marseille for, for um, many years. And the other one is actually somebody from the, 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 the Supremat, which is the Center for Economic Planning from Flans, which operates as a research center, doesn't plan anything. And it's Jean Michel Gamon. Uh, I, I, I won't go into the work of into the into the, um, into the article of Jean-Michel Gramont because it's a very complicated article with differential topology and stuff like that. Uh, but essentially, Alan Kerman and Gramont destroyed totally the representative agent. No. And I use the Alan Kerman because it's in. And it builds, actually, like Frank Hahn on general equilibrium results. The Jean-Michel Gramont will be the best because he has more stochastic processes. Right. So, uh, it's quite interesting that after Jean-Michel Gramont in 1985 and produced that paper in Econometrica, which the story did contribute, this is the most, let's say, heavyweight type of destruction with a big idea of the rational expectation story, he hasn't produced anything else after that finish. He must have completely addled his brains and, and, and so on. Uh, but anyway, huh? so anyway, the, the Frank Hahn and Alan Kerman uh, it was well known that generally that you don't necessarily have just one single unique equilibrium in general equilibrium theory. This is well known. This has been known since the late 50s, since, since the 60s, that is when the general equilibrium theory, the Valrhesian general equilibrium theory, has been formalized in a complete mathematical framework. Then it became very clear that you can have many different equilibrium solutions. So you cannot say the economy tends to equilibrium all is well because you don't know what is this equilibrium. Okay? You can have many different equilibria. And this is this was well known. Okay, well known. So Frank and on that. So say so why do you the monetary non-inflationary equilibrium is because that is the rational expectation view is that there is a monetary there is a, a, a super money neutrality, super neutrality of money, and that you can get to a single <coughs> non-inflationary equilibrium that is incorrect on the general equilibrium basis. That's the Frank Hahn point. In the 70s, there was another result, analytical result, which is called the uh, Mantel Sonnenschein de Breu theory. Okay. 
Montel was actually a guy from Buenos Aires who moved to, to California. I think Caltech, or I don't know what was from Montel, uh, Zonenschein. Now, there is, a gap, there is a big book, big book, which is uh, called Advanced Macroeconomics. It's a big book like this by Mascolet and a whole bunch of people. You get to page 500, you get to page 500, but you don't have to read that book. You don't, don't read the dark thing. Don't read that book. <laughs> <laughs> also because it's, it's not of mathematics. Uh, but, in, in that book, you get to page 520 something, and then they talk, 520, we're talking toward the end, because the book is about 700 pages, right? So, and they say, the anything, the anything goes here, okay? They, they call the, they call the Bantel, Sonnenschein, the brother, the anything goes theorem. That is, you can say whatever, you, no matter, cosi esse mi pare. You, you can say whatever you want, you know, it, anything goes, a, anything goes. Anything goes in English means, in American English, it means, you know, just a, everything and the opposite of it. Yeah, that's a, the anything goes theorem. Now, neoclassical economics is based on the view that you have a systemic inverse relation between prices okay, and demand. That's what the law of demand. Remember that we put in, that's the law of demand. Price and quantity, okay? So that's systemic. You cannot have you cannot have a curve like that. Right. You follow me? Yeah, it, it destroys the theory. You understand? So you must have sustained inverse relationship between price and quantity. That is neoclassical economics. And this the notion of market clearing price is based on that. That's out of that you get the marginal rate of substitution. You get the, you get all the other things. You, you get the fact that when there are more apples, okay, you eat more apples and less pears. Uh, this is the story. There was, during the Irish famine of the mid-80s, there was a guy called Giffen, who was the statistician, the, the statistician of the country. And he, he analyzed, he analyzed the fact that although prices of certain agricultural, agricultural commodities agriculture in Ireland during the famine, where people needed food, the prices were falling, the demand was not rising. You follow me? Yeah? That, that the fall in the price of those goods, of those agricultural products, you know, cabbage, for instance, there was a fall in the price of cabbage, and people needed food right? because they did not have, there was the potato famine. And how come the, the prices are falling and there was not an indication of an increase in demand? You understand me? It's like falling, the uh, pr price apples. You have apples available, more apples. Price are fall, prices are falling, but there is no increase in demand. Okay, so why? Why? There should be an increase in demand. The quantity sold should increase, right? If prices are falling. So uh, how, how come that that is not this was not happening? That was the different paradox. It's called the different paradox. And they came all sort of this was he took it as a statistical, he asked himself, why is this happening? Okay? And they, uh, he came up with 
he didn't come up with answers because he was statistically interested in the phenomenon. What came up, what later Pareto, other people, theoreticians said, well, this means that there is a bunch of inferior goods that are not wanted. It's the inf inferior goods okay, that, that are, not, are not wanted. So, for the, but these inf inferior goods are just a minor part of the total goods available. Therefore, okay, then this law of demand does not apply to inferior goods. Okay? When there are inferior goods, but because inferior goods are a small part of the total output of the, the economy, therefore we can neglect them as a general argument. We know that there is this problem with inferior goods. Mm. Then came another case that came from Soviet Union, from Russia. There was a guy called Evgeny Eugene Slutsky. He was a mathematical <coughs> statistician, also statistician. He was working in the Soviet government. He was working in the Soviet government to develop elements, indicators for planning, for all that sort of stuff. And he developed a mathematical model, first of all, of demand for, for goods, for agricultural goods. In 1925, and he came up with a mathematical condition, which he considered to be quite okay to, to, to apply to that. Okay, it, it, it applies given the existence of uh, given the existence of inferior goods. He was aware of this problem, Slutsky, and came up with the so-called Slutsky conditions. The Slutsky conditions are the fact that you must, in order to have a proper market process, that you sell all the cabbages and get the borscht that you want and all that sort of stuff, yeah? uh, uh, you, uh, you uh, must uh, have always dominated, the principle of substitution should dominate over the income effect. So Slutsky is the one who mathematically formalized the relationship between substitution effect and price effect. What is the substitution? The price effect is more apples, less, less lower price. Okay? That's the price effect. Okay? That's the substitution effect. Okay? The, if there are more apples, more cabbages in the in Ukraine, in, in Ukraine, you have more cabbages, then you have more posh. Because, uh, and you get less utility and less marginal utility out of that, but you still have more posh, which is the same. Okay? And, uh, and, uh, <coughs> and you have more, and, and, and because the price of cabbages is low. And so you eat more cabbages than hay, than siyot. And that operates toward market clear. Can, huh? can, can you clarify for me what was his conditions that in order okay. to Okay, no, no, I'll tell you right now, and now it's called Slutsky conditions. I'm explaining them now. Okay. First is the substitution effect. Mm -hmm. Namely, you have more cabbages and, uh, relatively to uh, Siotka, which is the Small pain, yeah. <laughs> and therefore you will eat more borscht than zero. Okay? <laughs> and the price will correspond to that. In other words, you have less price for cabbages mm -hmm. relatively to the price of the zero. Then this, the other thing is, however, to take into account the income effect, because the cabbages are produced by the peasants, by the farms. Right? If the price of cabbages goes down, you understand? Mm -hmm. Then the income of the, of the people who sell the cabbages also will be affected. And the income is spent. Right? The income of the people who sell the cabbages, they will also becomes a factor which generates demand, right? Because they will spend. But because their income has been affected, the spending 
should also be affected, which means they will spend less because they have less income. The price of cabbages has gone down, they have less income. By demanding less, they will bring also down the price of the things that they are demanding. Do you understand? And therefore, the income effect goes against the substitution effect. Do you understand? Because you have to look, buyers are also sellers. That's the important point. They will raise the prices. Because they demand less, they will raise the prices. No, no, no. They will demand. They will, no, no, they will not. No, no. They will demand less. Okay. And therefore, they, the things that they will demand, okay, will, will not find the market. And therefore, they, the sellers of the things that are demanded by the producers of cabbages will, will have to, the prices will fall. You understand? So the substitution effect is what goes, is in clash with the income effect. Do you understand me? So if you look only from the point of view, there is an output, there is a available stuff, apples, ciliotka and, and, and cabbages, apples and pears and stuff like that. And you look in terms of the quantities and you apply the substitution effect, okay, then it means that if you have more apples or more cabbages, the, the price of cabbages or apples goes down. <coughs> but then you have to ask what happens to the income of the people who are selling the stuff, the price of which goes down. Because we have a general equilibrium framework where buyers are also sellers. Sellers are buyers and buyers are sellers. And therefore, they, and how do they, they demand things? How the, how the sellers can demand, because the seller is not just a seller, they have also to eat, they have to buy other things. Uh, uh, somebody who sells cabbages, okay, has to buy cereal. Okay, that, that's what, and therefore, and therefore, how do you, you have to take that into account. If the income of the seller goes down, the demand yes. that the seller generates goes down, and therefore, the, the, the products that he or she would have otherwise bought, will have less market and the prices will go down. Okay? So that's the that's the Slutsky condition. So Slutsky found out that in order for the market to behave properly, to the demand functions to be expressed properly, it is necessary that the sub that the substitution effect that's the mathematical condition that he came up with, that the substitution effect will be always stronger than the income effect. Do you understand? So when you have a substitution effect has to be stronger than the income effect. That's the mathematical condition. How can he achieve that? That's a mathematical condition. That's a mathematical. That's your answer. It's maths that we don't understand. No, the mathematical condition means that we have two forces. It's like in, in physics, we uh -huh. have two forces. The vector should be determined by the force which is greater than the other. Okay, so the force of the substitution effect has to be stronger than the force of the income effect. I understand In, this. Okay? But I mean, how does it happen? Wait, wait, wait. Okay. Wait, wait, wait. okay. And, and so it became an assumption. Okay. In, this is called gross substitution. Gross substitution. So, yeah, and with gross substitution, this thing goes, and you have that, and you have the law of demand again. So, but, but, so well, no, we, have, we have two effects, but one has to be stronger than the other for this to be obtained. That's, so that's the mathematical condition. Okay. And it, then, it used to be 
after that, after Slutsky. Slutsky made people aware of that. Because he was a mathematician, a statistician. Again, Slutsky was not theoretical. It was to define a, a framework in which to analyze markets and for planning. That was his, his, his own interest. So, people became, but that's very important by mathematical economics, the Slutsky conditions. Very, very important. Because, then, whenever you talk about that stuff, you have to make sure that you have to assume, you must make the assumption that growth substitution prevails. That is to say that the substitution effect is stronger than the income effect. And that was taken for granted. Because it's okay, yes, there is Giffen, the other statistician in Britain in the midst of the, midst of the Irish famine. The Giffen, Okay, that, that's a different group, inferior groups, and this and that. Okay, but on, on, by and large, growth substitution operates, is, is working. By and large, we assume that for the larger class of goods, growth substitution operates. Hmm? And that was left there. It was left there. Come 1970. 1972 or 1973. By 1970, the whole general equilibrium framework, the modern mathematical version of general equilibrium, which is called Aaron de Breu. There were two people. Uh, uh, Gerard de Breu, French mathematician who migrated to the United States, lived most of his life at Stanford University. And he formulated with his other friend, who is still alive, also Nobel Prize, both of them Nobel Prize in economics because of that. Kenneth Arrow, also at Stanford University. No, Bert, the, the brain was not at Stanford, sorry, it was at Berkeley, right? It's nearby. And, uh, and Arrow was at, at, at Stanford. They formulated the modern version of general mathematical equilibrium. They did. So, they left one among other things, they left, however, one big problem unsolved, okay? That is to say, is the equilibrium, so what, what Aaron and the Berg found is that you can, you can come up with a mathematical equilibrium. You can, but if you ask this question, you ask this question. It's very important how you ask the question, really. Ask the question. In a, in a system of many commodities, without assuming production, which has said many commodities, can we find a price vector, a price, price vector is a combination of all prices, right? A price vector, like in geometry, price vector, can we find a price vector which clears all the markets? You understand? Which clears the market. Price vector when all goods are sold and purchased and etc. Can we find is that in, in in a space in an economic space analytical economic space is there a point in which this price vector exists and this price therefore is a market clear price? Answer yes, there is. Mathematically you can find it. Not in reality, in the theory you can find this price vector that all the supply all the goods which are offered are sold and because they are demanded at equilibrium price. This equilibrium price, no one knows how it is fixed, okay? how, how we establish. This is why Aaron de Breu had a central planning system of price, of prices. There is <coughs> this auctioneer, this valuation auctioneer, okay, that decides gets all the information and decides the price at which things trade at equilibrium. You follow me? This is it. This. But they found the mathematical solution. They found the mathematical solution. The existence of a price which clears all market. They found it. But what they did not find, it's 1959, 1954, 1959, these are the two years in which they produced this. Uh, what they did not find was whether this equilibrium is stable, which is not irrelevant because 
what if there's some any force that pushes the system out of equilibrium, will it come back to it or not? Will it come back to it or not? Do you follow? Because if it doesn't come back to it, the system is not an equilibrium system anymore. It can go anywhere. Right? Right, so they started searching for equilibrium, for stability of the equilibrium. This, so they found that the equilibrium may exist. They did not find, theoretically, whether equilibrium is stable. So they, they tried to look, that's also a mathematical enterprise, that's a mathematical business, to, to check for stability. And because the system is pretty complicated mathematically, it was a thing to So these people, this, the purpose among them, they work on the stability issue of the general equilibrium Okay? Sonnenschein was the Mantel was the first, then came Sonnenschein and the Bird, then the Bird and then Sonnenschein. In three papers, all connected papers, not that they were dividing, they, they were exchanging. All connected papers, they found the following. That for stability to exist, okay, Slutsky, Slutsky conditions must prevail. Okay, that is, the substitution effect should be stronger than the income effect. But in working out the application of Slutsky's condition to the stability problem, they found out, it came out out of the mathematics they did not know about, that by and large, Slutsky conditions don't apply, don't work. In other words, they found out that there is no way you can establish theoretically that the substitution effect dominates over the internet. In other words, there is no way you can establish this. <coughs> in the reality. Huh? In the reality. So basically. No, no, it's, it's, all, in theory, it's all metaphysics here. It's not, nothing to do. Well, it's in the theory. It's the theory says the demand and supply are equal, the price is an equilibrium price, all this and that. Well, that depends on the Slutsky conditions being uh, valid. But if Slutsky conditions are not valid, if Slutsky conditions are not obtained all the time, okay, then the system theoretically is not valid. It's not true. Okay, that's that's uh, so. What Mandel, Sonnenschein, and the Breur found in these three different papers is that it is not very likely that you can make this assumption that the substitution effect dominate, oh, dominates over the income. And in fact, they found that, especially Sonnenschein, that's the importance of Sonnenschein paper, Sonnenschein, they found that by and large you will actually, the probability that you have the income effect dominating over the substitution effect is quite strong. In other words, the prices and demand are not necessarily related inversely. They are not inversely related. You follow me? Because for market equilibrium theories to work, if you want to say, let the market work, the market does its best job, etc., you must make the assumption that prices and quantities are always related inversely. Do you understand that? Do you understand this? When you say let the market work, it always means that if you throw socks into the market, more socks, the price of socks goes down. And this will entice people to buy more socks. You must always make this assumption that dominates over the loss of income by the sock sellers. Okay? Into 
the economy. But if the sub sellers lose income and they therefore will demand less of oranges, less of the watches, then, then, the, then they will reproduce the conditions. Okay, they, they will reproduce non-market clearing conditions. This is the the, the thing. So what the Mantel, Sonnenschein, and the Brewer theorem uh, stated is simply uh, set of theorems, as a matter of fact, is simply that <coughs> demand curves, demand functions, and prices are not necessarily inversely related. Okay? If I say demand goes up and you are and you believe in the validity of Slutsky conditions, what, you have, what, what is your answer? If I say demand is going up, you must say that price, price. price. No, demand goes up. So price prices price go up. Right. Price. Yeah. Mm. Demand goes up. Price. Price. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Whereas in the case uh, of, uh, of uh, therefore this means that prices, okay, the prices should we always be inversely related to the quantities to the quantities available. Okay, that's 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 the story. Price, demand functions, and prices should be inversely related. This this is this is the in. If this is not true, then number one, the system is not stable. But it's more than that. Is that you cannot establish a proper framework for demand and supply relations. So Alan Kerry, he, where is he? In 1989 and in 1992, which is a paper I have, which is called, which is called uh, uh, Who uh, Does the Representative Agent Represent, uses the Sonnenschein Mantel theorem, Sonnenschein uh, Mantel, Sonnenschein de Breu theorem, to show that the representative agent is inconsistent with herself himself. Why? Because the representative agent is both a seller and a buyer. You understand? And being both a seller and a buyer, unless Slutsky conditions dominate, that is gross substitution, if, if, if the agent is a real representative agent, that is, he represents sellers and buyers, and we know on the basis of, of Slutsky condition that the seller and the buyer can be represented by, by just one agent only if the gross substitution dominates. But if it does not dominate, the representative agent becomes schizophrenic. Become like schizophrenia. You know, it is it's, it's psychopathic, in other words, or some kind becomes uh, anxious. I don't know, I don't know. Crazy, that's right. Becomes crazy, right? Why? Because the representative agent is inconsistent with the seller and the buyer. Why? Because the two elements clash. So it, 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 it has to go to the psychiatric hospital. <laughs> yeah, because it has two personality in one. Yes. Yeah, that's because it has the personality of the seller and the personality of the buyer. Okay. If Slutsky conditions were to prevail, he would, he or she would not have this problem because is the is the demand and supply would be uh, in equilibrium and in stable equilibrium. But in the case, as the Sonnenschein and Dan theorem shows, you uh, cannot have, by and large, not as you can, you can have, but it's not a general case necessarily. You cannot extend it to a general case. The um, Slutsky conditions do not dominate, and therefore you do not have an inverse relationship between demand functions and prices. They don't move inversely. Then the result is that the representative agent is torn apart. Okay? The representative agent represents two conflicting, two conflicting personalities within 
one thing. Yeah? And therefore, the rational expectation idea of having collapsing the economy into one agent behavior is bunk. Okay, that's, that's, that was the that was the end of that expectation. The end. The end. But the the the, the uh, damage was done. No? The, the damage was done because then okay, then they came out of people and they started to say okay okay. Then we have rational uh, rational expe rational expectations with asymmetries. We, so basically with imperfections, okay, there are imperfections in the system, but they always assume the fundamental theory to be at some stage working, you see? And the Russian expectation theory ended in the 1990s, in 91, 92, that's the period in which it was completely thrown, shown to be, to be stupid. Uh, and but the damage remained. The damage was that it basically infused people, uh, central banks, uh, government uh, agencies, etc., with the idea that you do not have to, that, that the fiscal policies in the Keynesian sense um, should not be undertaken. Yeah. Very important, very important, very, very important. Because that was one of the, of the, of the few things that was applied. That very important. Uh, in corollary, but even it's more important than the theory itself, the corollary, is the application of general equilibrium theory to the financial markets. And that was really applied, was really applied. And it's called the efficient market hypothesis the efficient market hypothesis that was developed in the 1970s by a guy called Fama, F-A-M-A, -A, efficient market hypothesis. This guy got the Nobel Prize just last year, just, uh, yes, it's in October, he got the Nobel Prize in uh, last October, uh, Fama, his name is. And, uh, yes, efficient market, efficient market, market? hypothesis. Yeah. The efficient market hypothesis simply tells you exactly that the market, why, why the markets are efficient. Why they are efficient is they give you all the information that you need. Okay, so that's the efficient, and therefore the prices that you get from stocks, shares, whatever, there are two prices. That is, there are the prices that give you the exact information concerning the value of a company, the value of a stock, etc., etc. So that is the efficient market, which is as idiotic as the idea that the world is a general equilibrium world. It's exactly, it's even worse because it's so simplistic, it simply assumes that the, it is an assumption. It's worked out as a theory because they want, then they build into that all sorts of mathematical probabilistic models for bank asset management. It's one of the few areas where we found applications, but the applications were disastrous, okay? Were disastrous because the whole system of derivatives is built on the efficient market hypothesis. And, and uh, they uh, applied that to uh, the financial market. <coughs> Developing, therefore, the view that financial markets are always true indicator of efficiency, profitability, etc., which is completely untrue. And here I finish by, if we can go back a second with Keynes, just Keynes, if I can find it, just wait, wait a bit. Uh, and uh, we go a second to Keynes. Keynes has two lines against financial markets, which are just fantastic. Just, these are, I understand Keynes by bit and pieces. It has three, two, three lines against financial markets, which are 
uh, which are fantastic. I should have done it really in the but then I talked to Pepe Mastu, so I should have done it in the so uh, Fantastic line that says, I'll tell you I'll find someone, but whenever I want to find it right away, I do not find it. <coughs> uh, but he has this fantastic line, it says, financial markets change the valuation of assets many times during a day, a week, and so forth, right? Change the valuation of markets. No, financial of assets. Ah, okay. The assets. Okay, okay. The, duty, the financial markets, it means the stock market, they change the valuation of financial markets. Well, maybe, how that and then I saw it. Well, but with the market with value, I saw something which was similar. Oh. Yeah? You were saying, yeah. Change. I'm Maybe because he uses change in market a lot, so. <laughs> I just said, uh, and then, he, and then, he, but basically what he says, I'll tell you because I remember it pretty well, but I like, I, uh, I would have preferred to find his own expression besides it, because it's beautiful. It's really good. He, he used to write very well, you know, he was a very literary, literary person, which economists are uh, not today, you know, just in the not write anything. Um, uh, but uh, if you know the words, you can go with that. I know, but here I cannot find it. No, you can go with a control F. Okay, right, thank you. <laughs> uh, so, that's a fantastic, with the separation, that's like Marx, okay? The is like Marx. With the separation between ownership and management. Can we see which, which part, which yeah. chapter? And... It's chapter 12, then we'll okay. begin with the economic search. Uh, with the separation between ownership and management, which prevails today, with the development of organized investment markets, investment markets is the stock exchange, okay? A new factor of great importance has, has entered in, which sometimes facilitates investment, but sometimes adds greatly to the instability of the system. And that's where we want to focus, we want to focus on the instability. In the absence of security markets, there is no object in frequently attempting to revaluate, to revalue an investment to which we are committed. Security markets is a stock exchange, right? 
that's what the security map is. So if there are no security maps, an investment, which means tractor, which means that sort of stuff, real investment, well, you are committed to it, you are committed to make an investment and buy a tractor because you need to till the land, produce and sell the stuff, okay? So you cannot, you don't revalue or devalue the tractor. The tractor will be devalued through the process of obsolescence and all these sort of things, but not through an operation concerning the, say, the, the securities that are issued in the financial markets, because there, there are no financial markets, okay? But he says, the stock exchange revalues many investments every day. And the revaluations give a frequent opportunity to the individual, though not to the community as a whole, to revise his commitment. Yeah? Because some things go up, so that, therefore the individual can change the investment portfolio by selling and buying securities. Right? And this is the fantastic statement. This is here, okay? Yes. This is. It is as though a farmer, having tapped his barometer after breakfast, could decide to remove his capital from the farming business between 10 and 11 in the morning and reconsider whether he should return to it later in the week. Okay? So it is as if you decide to withdraw capital, physical capital, from, I don't know, Airbus industry, Fiat is not finished, bye bye, but uh, uh, so they give me as, as if Mercedes decides to close down the factory, sell the factory, remove the factory from. Uh, uh, Stuttgart uh, between uh, one day and another and then bring it back when the evaluation is favorable to the Mercedes stock. Of course, you will not have Mercedes produce. It is impossible right, to produce. That's what he said. That's his argument. The financial, the operation of financial markets is erratic. It's not systemic. It's not systemic because it's based on guesses about the future, it's based on, uh, on things which uh, can change, by the way, all the time because the role of financial markets is to make stuff liquid. You, know, you, you cannot sell an oil tanker, for instance. You know, to sell an oil tanker, you need a complex process because it's a big indivisible thing. But if you can split up the oil tanker into all sorts of uh, pieces of paper that you call derivatives, that you call securities, you can, you can do that. But it's got nothing to do with the functional operation of the oil tanker, which is to go and then start going through the sailing through the seas with, uh, you know, with oil in it, or, uh, and then going back to pick up other oil and other amount of oil, etc. That's got nothing to do. So you divide up the oil tanker hmm, in many pieces of papers, which are securities and derivatives linked to securities. They work in a totally different, separate manner from the physical investment represented by. And that's that's Keynes. So Keynes' efficient market hypothesis is <laughs> completely bank stuff for him. Completely, totally bank stuff. And he understood it. These two lines destroy it. The efficient market hypothesis. Right away. By the way, Keynes was a big player on the London Stock Exchange, right? Because he had to finance his wife. <laughs> yeah, he has to finance the theater. The, and the theater, and so he would play to, to raise the money in order to. This theater is still in Cambridge, now it's not private, it's public, it belongs to the. I don't know, to the county or the Cambridge municipality or something like that. The one for his uh, wife. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to stay there with him, right? She, yeah, she said, look, I'm staying here with you in Cambridge only if look, this place is so stupid okay, <laughs> right, that I'm staying here only if I find something to do. And he got up and 
raised the money to set up this theater where she became the director and the choreographer because she was coming from right. you come from the idea it means that you come from top 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 the ballet company okay top the music she danced in yeah now she danced in St. Petersburg she danced most every all these big city Paris and so forth you come to Cambridge <laughs> <laughs> food is not good to begin with <laughs> uh, and what's What's there? You know? Not even London, Cambridge. So she said, "Okay, I'm going. I'm, it's okay. It's nice. The country is nice. The country in Cambridge is very really nice." So he said, "She said, I'm staying here, but you, I want to have something to do." And came spoke up and raised the money in the stock exchange. And uh, raised, and you used to lose a lot of money, but because he was he had collections, it was from the top, top uh, aristocracy, uh, intellectual aristocracy in Britain, right? He, he studied in Eton, so he studied in Eton and so on. So, he used to get, the, he had friends who would lend him money, you know? And so he would replay again, or would game, and would pay the friends and would give money to the theatre. You see, he had a cycle. So he knew how the stock exchange worked very well. He knew it very well. But also, he started as an economist, uh, to work as an economist before the First World War. He started to work as an economist at the, it's called the government of India. The British, for the British, India was so important that it, it, it had a special section in the colonial administration which was called the government of India. And he is, was, working on monetary issues in relation to the government of India. And in fact, one of his first books after the war, he wrote two important books immediately after the war. One is called The Economic Consequence of Peace, of the Versailles Treaty. That book is phenomenal, is absolutely phenomenal. And it was not yet Keynesian, it was not yet Keynesian, it was still traditional. Neoclassical economics. Huh? And then he wrote a second book a few years later called A Tract for Monetary Reform, yeah? to reform the, the British Empire monetary system after the First World War. And so on. The, the, the book I mentioned that he wrote after the Versailles Treaty, he published it in 1920. It was a short book, it's a kind of almost a pamphlet, which is called a, The Economic Consequence of Peace. That book is absolutely, it's easy to read, it's uh, absolutely phenomenal. Basically, he, not basically, he says, this peace in the side will lead to a new war. Well, because he was very much against the imposition of reparation on Germany. He said the type of reparations that are demanded from Germany, Germany will never be able to pay. Never. Never be able to pay. The only way in which Germany can pay this reparation is simply to export so much that other countries would not be able to accept those, would not absorb those exports. Okay? And so alternative would mean that Germany would have to default on its debt. And that's what the, the condition is, the impoverishment of Germany, impoverishment of Europe, and war conditions. That's what the, the, 1920, 1920 he saw, he saw exactly very well what the Versailles Treaty was generating in, 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 in this book. And this is why he left. He was the advisor of Prime Minister um, Lloyd George. Advisor, he was the advisor of Prime Minister during the Versailles Treaty negotiations and he resigned. He said, look, I don't want to have any part. It's, it's going to be crap, okay? Total crap. And so he, he quit and he wrote that, that uh, book which is called The Economic Consequence of this. So Keynes was always very uh, sensible person, even when he was not Keynes, you see, he was always said, he always said things which really made a lot of sense all the time. Yeah? 
that was a really remarkable person in, in the history. And uh, it's also it's funny that he, Georges Clemenceau, who was the French Prime Minister, and later he would become the French President, Georges Clemenceau, hated Gates with a passion. Because Gates had a typical upper class approach to France, right? And so, in the official language, in diplomacy, it was still French, right? And, <coughs> And Keynes would speak English. And Clemenceau, and he knew French. Clemenceau would say, but he had to speak French. And Keynes said, no, we are not at the restaurant. We are not ordering wine. <laughs> and we are doing real business here, and therefore we have to speak English. And Clemenceau was absolutely living. About that limit, yeah? because in the French aristocratic Cambridge, in fact, they're stupid. <laughs> no, not in the French, in the English, I'm sorry. In the English aristocratic circles, you know, aristocratic top, Cambridge, uh, Oxford, that's some stupid places, you know. Uh, the France is croissant, <laughs> one man. Uh, but they are ridiculous. No, France is. Is croissant, is uh, wine, and is uh, south of France, uh, south of France, and also Courchevel, uh, and also uh, uh, skiing places. That's what France is. You know? That's how they see France, and that's the aristocratic view of uh, <coughs> the aristocratic. That's typical, typical. Right? Uh, uh, and so, for example, when I, I was in Cambridge in the, in the 70s, but I thought that people, because I like to speak French, I like, but I'm forgetting English, like Zaffer. Zaffer, at the end of his life, he forgot English. You know, he only went, lived in England since 50, odd until he died, 60 years almost he lived in England, and yet by the end of his life, through dementia and stuff like that, he forgot English and went back to Italian. Spoke only Italian. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing this out, yet yeah, being totally demented, partly demented, yes, but not totally. I, I, I'm doing the same. I only uh, use English for the things that I need to use English, otherwise I don't. And, uh, and I think in. Uh, but it doesn't happen to me in French. In French, which is also one of my languages since I was small, uh, it doesn't happen to me in French. So I don't withdraw from French. Of course, I don't withdraw from Italian, but I withdraw from it. And, um, and when I was in Cambridge in the 70s, I, I, I didn't understand those people. And uh, uh, I didn't understand the mentality of those people. But they were saying phrases in French. Yeah? In the seminar in Cambridge, pour encourager les autres. No? So I thought that they, would, they were speaking French. Oh, don't vous parlez français. Yeah? And they, would, they didn't speak anything. <laughs> there were set phrases from the, from the aristocracy, right? From the aristocratic, uh, the aristocratic background, not their own background, but the culture, because they, the, the British English aristocracy for a long time wanted to be French. You know that. Even, even the, you know that. Don't you know that? No. The English royalty. Till the Cromwell, till Cromwell really, they wanted to be French. Their big thing was to go back to Paris and be kings in Paris, not in. That's why they landed all the time. They would go and land in, uh, and there was Jean d'Arc and all these people, but because they wanted to be French, they wanted to go back to France. Yeah? That, that's the and, and, and French, the English. Was they didn't speak all that much English. You know, they, they, English is a, is a language that came from the, a bit like uh, vulgar Italian, so Italian vulgar, you know, the Latino vulgar. That's how, what uh, it came from the bottom up. And Shakespeare, Chaucer and Shakespeare are considered to be among the founders of the English language because they, they generated the literature and stuff like that. But the English aristocracy wanted to, to, they spoke French for a long, long time. 
they spoke French. And even today, the English royal family, they speak French as their second language. They are taught French as a second language because of the tradition, not because they want to go back to France anymore. <laughs> <coughs> so they have these sort of things that you know they have set phrases, and, but but I thought that they, they spoke. So I said, oh, then then you can speak English. No, no, no way. They have no idea. They, they don't understand. They are totally deaf to this <laughs> to that stuff. Okay, anyway. Um, that's it. So that's great, great, you know. And uh, okay, let's finish. And of course. No. Because it's old. I send you the questions, okay? The set of uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make a talk with Pepe uh, how to do it. But um, you know, but I, I give you a number of topics that you can choose from, mm -hmm. and you write an essay for me, and, and you send it to me by email. And when? Right? When are you? <laughs> but before they want there there will be a date. That's what I have to ask because they have to put the months. The dates. Yes. How long has this been? How many pages? That's what I'm, I'm going to negotiate. Uh, you're going to negotiate in favor of us. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think on, on average. I mean, also I think it's a bit. That's why I make this more is short because it's less time to correct me. But I usually should be around 2,000, 2,500. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay.